Today we will talk about how Europe, the European Union more specifically, has reacted uh, to the war. And when we do that, I must admit that I'm a little bit of an EU nerd. So I've done EU stuff ever since 1989, either as a student, an academic, a civil servant, a banker or a politician. Uh, and my perspective in that sense might be a little bit on the subjective side. But let me give it a try. And I'll do it again by giving you an introduction, three points and a conclusion. By way of introduction, I should say that I've never seen the European Union act with more determination speed and unity. And there's always this saying that the European Union advances through crisis. I think it was Jean Monnet who originally came up with this idea. And it is certainly true. The biggest steps or leaps in European integration have always been taken through crisis. And as we, always know, as we all know, uh, when the European Union integrates, it leads to pressure to integrate somewhere else. So here we go. First, what do I mean when I say determination? Second, what do I mean when I say speed? And third, what do I mean when I say unity? First then, determination. You know, I used to say that the European Union advances in three phases. Phase number one, crisis, phase number two, chaos, and phase number three, suboptimal solution. Well, this time around, I think it was directly from crisis mode to almost optimal type of decision. I think we have gone beyond the point of no return. And by that I mean to say that with Putin, he's not going to turn around and with the European Union taking the moves that it has and with the determination that it has shown, I don't think it's going to backtrack uh, either. I have never seen such strong public support for the actions that the European Union is doing. Because remember that usually when the EU does something, the general public is actually quite reluctant and it wants to slow down. I mean, would, have we, would we want to go to a common currency like the euro? Probably not, because we were quite attached uh, to the currency at the time. But this time around, the public is saying to European leaders, you have to move faster with sanction. You have to show more political leadership. So determination has been the first thing. Second, speed. When I say that the European Union advances through crisis, let's take three examples from the recent past. The first one was the euro crisis, which of course started off as a financial crisis and a subprime crisis. Now, it depends a little bit how you calculate things, uh, but I guess for our purposes we can say that it took a long time, a minimum of 24 months, to put together the European stability mechanism, which was basically the 80 billion euro bazooka to save and protect uh, European or Euro country economies. The second crisis, of course, was COVID. And there, it was really interesting to see that it took only four months for the European Union to set up the biggest rescue package in the history of European integration. It ended up being called Next Generation uh, Europe, but basically it contained loans and it contained subsidies and also the mutualization of debt. Add to the top of that, that the European Commission was procuring vaccines and all of this happened within a span of few months we thought that this was the world record of reactivity of the European Union. 
Little did we know that the third crisis, after the Euro crisis and Covid, would be lurking behind the corner. And when it hit on the 24th of February, it took only four days for the European Union to basically take its most aggressive weapons uh, so far in sanctions by rolling out not one, not two, but three waves of sanctions. And also it took only four days to take a decision to send uh, armament finance of roughly half a billion uh, euros. And of course, on top of that, the reversal of German foreign security uh, and defense policy. So it was very much the Hamiltonian moment of European common foreign and defense policy. And it only took four days. So the speed at which the European Union reacted was mind-boggling in many ways and very unusual. Uh, so we have both determination and speed, but the third point, which also I think has been rather spectacular from a traditional European perspective, has been the unity that we've seen among European states. And by that I mean to say that before the war began, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov sent out a letter to a lot of OSCE, European Security and Cooperation, or Organization of European Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, letter to EU countries and NATO countries and said, you cannot answer these demands separately. Well, what did the European Union do? What did NATO do? Well, of course, they signed a letter, one letter, collectively, instead of 27 separate EU letters. Uh, and the weapons that were used in unity immediately, sanctions, arms, financial aid, and decisions on refugees, so far 3.5 million, or decisions on enlargement. Uh, I've never seen unity like this in the European Union before. You see, you have to understand that in previous crises, there have always been uh, different types of divisions. So during the Euro crisis, it was North versus South, so austerity versus growth. In the asylum crisis of 2015, it was very much East versus West. But in COVID already, we started to see a unified European Union and certainly in the war in, in, in Ukraine, we're seeing exactly the same thing. Now, let me conclude. Do I sit here and say that in the future, Europe will be full of determination, speed and unity? And we have taken the final federative step towards a European utopia where there will be no more bickering between member states anymore and we will live happily ever after? The answer to that question is self-evidently no. Uh, so I do however argue that if a step in European integration has been taken, say a banking union or a health union or actually a defense union, it's very difficult to backtrack. And I think this will stick, this will last. But, but, and here is the big issue. It is very important to understand that in Europe, solidarity towards Ukraine is time limited. There will be a best by date. As much as we stand behind Ukraine at the moment, there will be a moment when we start looking elsewhere. It is absolutely natural. And that is why I think it's extremely important for European leaders today to begin to communicate the price of war and the price subsequently of peace. Because the truth is that this war will cost us inflation, higher energy prices, higher food prices, and a new refugee crisis. These are not 
an easy sell. Therefore, political leadership in Europe today is a message that we stand behind Ukraine, we support Ukraine, but there is a price that we have to pay for the freedom of Ukrainians. And that is a price that you pay at your local supermarket, at the local petrol station, in helping out refugees, and at the end of the day, uh, also with your gas and electricity bills. I hope that Europe learns a lesson from this. Because we did two mistakes. We were naive in relying on Russian gas and American security. I think it's time for understand that we cannot trust and rely on Russian energy. We cannot forever be dependent on American security. And therefore, this should be a wake-up call. But a wake-up call only if we continue to be determined, if we continue to have speed, and especially if we stand united. The Russian army is committing barbaric action.